Welcome to Lakehead University's Reconciliation event. We are happy that you are able to join us today. Denise Baxter, Indigenous, Makwadodam, Martin Falls, and Donjaba. My name is Denise Baxter, Vice Provost of Indigenous Initiatives at Lakehead University, and I will be your MC for your event today. Lakehead remains committed as part of its uh, commitment to social justice and social responsibility to advance the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action and Universities Canada principles for Indigenous education. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendation to build capacity for intercultural understanding, empathy and mutual respect has become a guiding principle for the commitments Lakehead has made in both Northwestern Ontario and Simcoe County and will continue to guide our efforts in the future. Before we begin, I would like to share an important notice of audio video recording of the event today. Participants are reminded that this online event is being recorded. We are doing this to preserve a record of the event in the university's archives and to publicize and promote Lakehead University. By attending, you are agreeing to be included in the recording and its public dissemination in any media now known or later developed anywhere in the world in perpetuity. Um, we are going to have an opportunity for a question and answer towards the end of our hour together. So I invite you to put any questions you would like us to um, consider in the chat uh, on the side. And um, I would also just like to make an acknowledgement that I am in um, Thunder Bay, which is the territory of Fort William First Nation and Empke Wajou, uh, signatory to the Robinson Spirit Treaty of 1850. And we have a, our other campus is in uh, the city of Aurelia. And it is in the, the region of the Chippewa Rama First Nation, the Tri-Council. And we would also like to acknowledge our, our presence there as well. So uh, moving on to our special guest for today, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Uh, Nicole Richmond is Anishinaabe Kwe, a lawyer, wellness consultant, and educator from Biktagong Anishinaabe, who lives now in Thunder Bay. Nicole works with clients to support and empower Anishinaabe values, legal systems, and governments, and is a frequent presenter on topics including Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe law and Canadian law as it applies to Indigenous people. <clears throat> Nicole's presentation will provide background on a variety of treaties that impact the people who live in and around Wekwadang, Thunder Bay, and an emphasis on the Robinson Superior Robinson Huron treaties. Nicole will outline best practices for teaching about treaties and we'll provide resource material and comments on Anishinaabe pedagogy. So it is my pleasure to invite Nicole Richmond. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here. I am so honored and blessed to have this opportunity to be with you guys today. It's nice to see we have 63 people, and I thought at least 60 of them were going to be my cousins and Facebook friends, but there are many people that I don't know. Some people I do see that I know, I just wrote them down. Jules, uh, Kalinda, Jan, Mary, O'Donnell, Nancy, Alana, Regina, thank you for being here. Thank you for, to everyone for being here. And uh, it's, it's really good to be here. And when I say here, I just want to, I'm going to share my screen. I have a very long uh, set of slides for you guys. And I'm gonna play from start and we're just gonna see where we get with them. Um, when I say here, I mean on the territory of the Fort William First Nation in an empty Waju. We uh, Kwedong is what we called it when we were growing up, what my parents called it. Um, that's the Anishinaabe word for the bay. So if you ever look at a map, you can see that we're in a, actually in a huge bay. And we can see the we can see Nanabuju as we look from over the cliffs and over the hills. And we can see that this is the final resting spot of our um, great spiritual investigator, Nanabush. And he lies down in this sacred territory. And it overwhelms me to think about how this territory has become um, a real hub for Anishinaabe knowledge, for Anishinaabe people to experiment in different um, cultural practices that we're learning. And when I mean experiment, I also mean to say that we are growing in really important ways. And some of that growth is happening through suffering. And we know in this territory, there are a lot of Native people, Indigenous people who have uh, difficult experiences. And we have a lot to learn from those experiences. And so I want to share, I want to start off just by acknowledging that um, this territory is very powerful. I'm very pleased to be here, to be living back here. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about where I come from. But just to say also, when we 
acknowledge this territory, we also acknowledge that there are minerals, lots of minerals underneath this, underneath this um, Wequadong Bay, there's gold and silver and copper. And we feel the power of that energy as it gets drawn down into, uh, into our lives and into our realities here. So I'm gonna go through this presentation. Um, just to say again, to reiterate how powerful this land is. And my practice uh, as a lawyer has everything to do with consulting with clients, supporting clients. I'm the person that comes in when the clients say, well, we actually wanna start designing our own laws to do things in a, in a way that's meaningful to us. So I can give you the legal opinion about the Indian Act and I can tell you all about the constitution, but I'm developing this sort of um, love and desire to help Anishinaabe people from the ground regrow their institutions and redevelop their own ways of being, knowing, doing, seeing. And, and a lot of that has to do with the relationship to the land. And I was presenting actually yesterday to this law firm called Smart and Bigger. So some, maybe some of you are my lawyer friends and you will know that that is what, that's an intellectual law uh, firm from downtown Toronto. They have offices all over. And one of the questions was, you know, land acknowledgements, how can we do them in a way that's more meaningful? You know, when we read these land acknowledgements out loud, what's underneath that? And I like to share a story about one time I, I was with Helen, Helen Pelche, um, Jolene Banning, uh, and several others, and they actually brought me hiking around uh, an MP Waju. And I felt welcomed. I actually felt welcomed onto the Fort William First Nation territory because all of those people are Fort William First Nation members. And the territorial acknowledgement is important because it recognizes that there are ways of being and ways of relating to this land, this beautiful sacred territory that pre-exist, uh, that predate our contact, uh, so settler contact, and even you know my, my appreciation and experience on this land that are very significant and meaningful. And I just wanna say, and I'll go through this in my presentation, there are multiple ways of relating to the land um, that are not just intellectual. So as academics in this academic environment, often we focus on primary on the brain, right? On the intellectual ways. And my encouragement to you guys is we live in this beautiful territory, go and spend some time out in it. And I, I'm just gonna point out Jen, Richie, who's a marathon runner, an ultra marathon runner, spends tons of time on the land and you can learn so much about yourself by being on the land. And this is the sea lion at, at the uh, Sleeping Giant National Park. Um, and it's just from a, so I'm teaching law now. I'm teaching, um, I've taught this type of course so many times, I forget what it's called, Indigenous Legal Traditions here at Bore Alaskan Library. I'm sorry, Bore, Bore Alaskan Library was where I went to law school at the University of Toronto. Bore Alaskan Law School is um, here at Lakehead University. And one of the principles that I'm sharing and I'm meditating and contemplating is the ways that we relate to the land and the, the legal principles that we understand or the moral or ethical principles that we can distill. And I think a lot about the natural formations or uh, formations of rock or formations um, of spiritual significant, spiritually significant places and what that can teach us about the ways that we can relate to the earth. And so when I see a place like the sea lion, I think about the stories that my ancestors would have about what that meant, about what it, what that this would be a place of power that need, you would need to acknowledge and recognize and a variety of stories or um, teachings that would relate to the types of beings or the types of, um, holy beings, spiritual beings, otherworldly beings that might be paying special attention to this area together with you. And I want to, this is a big list and it's in orange. I tried to use orange in my presentation. Um, Anishinaabe Odsawin is a Anishinaabe word. So Anishinaabe is the Ojibwe word for Ojibwe. <laughs> we call ourselves the Anishinaabe people. So there are a few different ways that um, that word came into being. Some people say Anishinaabe means from whence original man was lowered. And um, there are different children's books and stories about the places that Anishinaabe people actually were lowered from, that there's a hole in the sky, the Pallades. Uh, Bagonegi Shig that we were lowered from. 
Uh, and I think the spiritual connection with the star beings and the um, sort of interdimensional realms are really interesting, very interesting to me. So the first principle um, from Anishinaabe Odsawin that I want to share is that we're all related to one another. So Nindinawe Maganag, it means everything is connected. So I'm connected to the earth, I'm connected to my family, I'm connected to my to the animals, I'm connected to the plants. And it's really a circular way of thinking about that, uh, thinking about the way that we're connected to one another. And from an experiential point of view, I can say this to you, I can say, yeah, we're related, but you need to experience being related. You need to experience going into ceremony. You need to experience being with community. You need to experience being with the animals to really understand this on a deeper level. The second principle, um, I'm thinking a lot about right now is this principle of Kondasawin, and I'm getting this uh, particular teaching from Basil Johnston. And he talks about this word Kondasawin, and it's the way that we experience the world and that we incorporate our knowledge about, through our experience, we begin to know more about whatever it is that we need to know. The third thing to say is truth is not absolute. So I'm giving you this presentation today, and I might, um, in I actually started this presentation based on a presentation that I have given probably 20 times. And I looked at it and I'm like, this doesn't make sense to me anymore because I'm different now. My sense of truth has changed and evolved. And so we acknowledge sometimes that truth is not absolute. Truth, your experience through your Kandasu, when you develop your sense of truth, your uh, way of understanding and relating to the world in a way that makes sense to you. And sometimes when Nishnabe people um, debate with each other, I will hear them say, Debwe, Debwe. And that just means that's true to you. And even though I don't necessarily agree with your truth, that doesn't mean we need to fight to the bitter end, that it's okay for you to sit over there and have your experience in your way. It's a very respectful, deferential principle. Um, the other thing I want to say is, and this is this was difficult for me to get to as a lawyer because lawyers um, <laughs> just say I was kind of an ineffective litigator because I was like, yeah, the other side has a great point. And sometimes we say mono, and that means put it down. It means it's okay. You will not always understand this. You will not always get to the bottom of this. It's okay to disagree. And I want to I want to actually bring you to the bottom one. It's called Shagwendamin. And this comes from my friend Brenda Rivers. She is the She's the director of governance from Sagamook. And I've been very, very blessed to, to work with Sagamook for the last six months. And she says, hold back a little bit. You know, sometimes when you are feeling strongly about things, it's not necessary to give your whole emotional dump at this time. Sometimes it's okay to hold back a little bit. Shagwendamin. And she also says, um, me ashawe zabi, that we're all healing. And so this also relates to your experience of truth. If you can get to a, a clearer place of understanding yourself, then you can get to a clearer place of truth. And finally, this one that we all know, Minobamadzuwin, Minobamadzuwin is, uh, is that we're living in balance. And this is a lot. I mean, this whole list of principles right now could be a whole university degree, and it should be a whole university degree when we get to building that kind of capacity and developing those courses. So I also want to say I have just spent, for those of you that know me well, I've just spent the last two years living in my home community. And um, it was beautiful because I got to spend a lot of time on the land, of course. I got to spend a lot of time in ceremony. I got to let, spend a lot of time with my family, my people that love me and that care for me. And one thing I learned that is so humbling about myself is that I'm nothing on my own. I am only special because of these people that hold me up and teach me and support me and love me. And I love that so much because I, um, I'm the youngest kid, you know, and I grew up being teased like so many of you. I got teased because I was loved, but I uh, have a hard time with this, this idea that I'm somehow a teacher now or a professor or, you know, I'm a knowledge keeper or whatever, because to me, I'm just little Nicole, like that sits in the corner of ceremony and listens and does my job to, uh, to be accountable and to be responsible. And I really want to reiterate that for Anishinaabe people. We understand that being in community and being in a relational connection with other people is what 
brings us into who we are. It makes us who we are. On my own, I am absolutely nothing. Um, just, I wanna say a few more things about indigenous knowledge before we, I will give you the details on the treaties. Um, I said this already, but it is more than just academic or intellectual or rational. There are multiple senses. There are multiple ways of knowing. My favorite example is the John Burroughs book. I'm looking for it, but I don't have it here on my, um, on my desk, on my kitchen table desk, <laughs> is uh, John Burroughs wrote this book and it's about Anishinaabe law. And he wrote it, he every night, not every night, but he would wake up in the morning and he would realize he had dreamed another chapter. And I think about when I was first learning how to sew. So those of you who know me know that I'm a seamstress in addition to the other things that I do. When I was learning to sew, I didn't quite know how to do what I was doing. And I would get so far, and then I would realize I didn't know what I was doing and I would have to go and lay down in my bed. And I didn't know this at the time, but what I was doing was I was meditating. And so in, when we meditate, we open up a channel that in a way that we can connect to knowledge that is other than um, our sensory knowledge so that we have mechanisms to communicate through our minds and through our spiritual knowledge with, um, with beings, the grandfathers and the grandmothers who are there to provide you guidance if you ask in a good way. And um, I also just want to say that ceremonies are also something that have been used historically and in a contemporary basis to ask for direction, um, to open things up in a good way. We call it in a good way and to help us make better decisions. And so, and this is the final point. I'm, I'm not going to go too far in this, um, but ceremonies can also be used to shift reality. So for Anishinaabe people, I'm sure we've all been in a ceremony where something magical, spiritual has happened. And I think when we, when we work in those realms, um, we're just accessing technology that we don't quite understand yet. And Anishinaabe people understood how to use these ceremonies in ways that were meaningful and that could be used for the for the for the betterment of the community. So, um, for example, I've seen bones healed. I've seen things manifest. I've seen, seen things um, happen that there's no good explanation for. But this is Anishinaabe Kandasuan. This is our experience. This is the way that we relate to the world. And this is real. This is real. Um, just one more example on this point. I went out hiking. This is probably, I don't know, maybe four or five years ago. This is one of my favorite slides to show. And I took a picture because this was spring and you can see how there are little um, tree branches that are growing. And I thought that was so beautiful. Look, it's new life. And then when I got home, I looked at the picture and I could see that there was this sort of rainbow smoke. And when I looked at it carefully, I thought, oh my goodness, there's writing in there. And so I looked at it more carefully and I showed some pictures, some friends on Facebook, which is my Anishinaabe and Dasuin costume. And this is what we found, God home. And I thought, this is a sign. Of course, my friends tease me all the time. They're like, Nicole, you're so obsessed with signs. And yes, that's the way that I am, a spiritual kid who's playing this role as lawyer and law professor and, and you know, seamstress and all of these things. But in my heart, I'm a spiritual person. And I thought, that we are so blessed to be living in God's home, to be the to have the gift of being a human at this time of evolution of the planet, of being in connection with Mother Earth, of everything that's going on as we're shifting in such important ways is a huge blessing. Which leads me to my most important treaty, I think, which is our relationship with Mother Earth. That is the foundational treaty. And when we think about ways that we can honor this treaty, I just wanna say the principles of treaty making and being in relationship with one another through treaty, it is important to continue to can reconfirm that relationship. It's not just to say, oh, okay, we came to an agreement once, you have to continually reconfirm your relationship. And one of the ways, I made a little list for you, the ways that I confirm my relationship with the land is Every time I feel in wonder and awe, and I think to myself, this is so amazing and beautiful, and I feel gratitude. I learn a lot about gratitude and what it means to be grateful. And, you know, gratitude is a prayer. Gratitude is a prayer of manifestation. So it's like to say that thank you, it's the law of attraction, right? You bring that into your reality through being grateful for it. So if I feel gratitude for the earth and the earth is showing me blessings, 
the earth will continue to bring me more blessings because I am opening my heart up to that. And we also acknowledge our relationship with the earth by making offerings and gifts. So um, offerings of tobacco, offerings of, it depends on um, who you're connecting with, but sometimes we put out little candies or shiny things, or we make offerings. Um, if we wanna make water crossings, we make offerings of tobacco to some of the spirits that are within the water. Um, it is a really important principle that you're going to see through some of the material that I'm going to show you this principle of making gifts, making offerings and making gifts. And Anishinaabe people, we know that the more that you give, the more that you receive. And we're not hooked on the material world <clears throat> in the same way. We know that um, what comes also goes and what goes also comes. And so if you get into this habit of being generous, you will only open yourself up to, to receive even more. Um, land acknowledgement is also important. And I touched on that a little bit. And dimensionality, I remember when I was a kid, I was convinced that if I went out into the bush, I would somehow come back from the trail and I would end up somewhere different <laughs> as if I had gone through a portal or something. But I think we can all get that feeling every once in a while that when you're out in nature or when you're by the water or when you're doing something very still and very sacred, you get the sense that there's more going on that you are not quite able to access yet. And I believe strongly that there are other dimensions and string theory tells us this, and I don't mean to go out into planet Neptune with this, but just to say that Anishinaabe people do acknowledge that there are multiple dimensions and ways of experiencing the world. So with respect to treaties, and I wanna give you that background because these are principles of Anishinaabe law that inform how we interpret treaties. So when we get to the point where we're looking at treaties on paper or we're reading about them or we're reading cases where we're seeing how the treaties are interpreted, Anishinaabe law informs the meeting of the minds at the time the treaty was made. And so, so people, you know, we need to know, we need to know the basis for how Anishinaabe people think because this informs the treaties that were negotiated. So um, indigenous nations have occupied traditional territories since the beginning of time. We know this. In my traditional territory, I, I'm, I forgot to say where I was from. I'm from Big Iktagong Mishnabek, which is on the North Shore of Lake Superior. Um, there are artifacts on the beach that date Anishinaabe people there something like 20,000 years ago. It's a very, very long connection. There have been people there for a very, very long time since before we remember. And there are pre-contact uh, international treaties. So the Hiawatha belt was a belt that was entered in between the five nations and then became the six nations. So the Mohawks, the Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Oneida and the Tuscarora subsequently entered. That signified a great peace that was to be entered into between the nations where there was a peace, there was a tree that was built um, and there was a deep hole that was, all of the weapons were buried underneath that great tree of peace. And these nations came into um, a treaty arrangement with one another. There's also the Dish with One Spoon Treaty, which is the a treaty between the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg, where there's an agreement to share together from one spoon, from one, uh, from one dish. And you notice uh, using a spoon means there are no hard edges. It's very soft. You can't poke each other. You have to eat. You have to have a little bit. And then you share with your friend. Um, I was just thinking about the time last week we were at this uh, event and my friend came off stage. It was this Wake the Giant. She was all... She had just done a big presentation and I gave her my ice cream and she ate from my same spoon. And I was thinking about the treaty relationship, the dish with one spoon and how much we love each other, right? We, when people, when we love people, we agree to eat from the same dish with them. And that is another principle of the treaty is that we love one another. These aren't just relationships where we coexist, but we also do really care for the well-being of one another. Also, when the earlier settlers came, the Mohawk, specifically the Haudenosaunee, entered into a relationship with the Dutch and then subsequently with the British called the Two Row Wampum. Um, and you'll see this represented. I didn't, I don't think I gave you a picture of the belt here, um, but it's two lines side by side where we recognize that we may be different, 
We may be doing different things, but we're going to respect that we're two rows, we're two ships in the same ocean or in the same sea or in the same channel. And we're not going to interfere or interrupt with one another. We are going to mutually respect and, and support one another. Um, so some of the commentary here is in one row is a ship with our white brother's ways and in the other a canoe with our ways either will travel each will travel down the river of life side by side neither will attempt to steer the other's vessel um this comes from the assembly of first nations sorry I um, <laughs> I keep seeing everyone that's coming in and out, so I'm sorry if I'm distracted by that. This comes from the Assembly of First Nations um, commentary about the importance of treaties. So they, there's a document, and I gave you the link down there. And I can have um, the Indigenous Initiatives Office share this presentation. So there are a bunch of links in here. If you want them, I, I can have them distribute that, or, or you can access that somewhere. So you don't have to write down the links today, but um, there's a document called First Nations Treaty Parties Statement Regarding Observance and Enforcement of Treaties. So the first principle is that a treaty is a sacred covenant, a solemn agreement that is truly the highest form of agreement, binding as long as the sun rises, the grass grows, and the river flows. And so when I talk to you about having a spiritual relationship with the land and that there are dimensions and that we have sacred relationships with the grandfathers, and you say, well, that's nice, Nicole, but I'm telling you, these are the principles that underlay the sacred covenant that we have with the land. It's the highest form of agreement. So solemn is a treaty that it centers around one of our most sacred ceremonies, the pipe. So when, um, you, when Anishinaabe leaders or Haudenosaunee leaders or Indigenous leaders would come together into a treaty council, there would be hours and days and who knows how long the people would come to Laura Comwin came to my um, indigenous legal traditions class and she said you know now chiefs come and they have a meeting in you know one day and maybe two days but when Anishinaabe people were historically gathering it might take weeks for them to come to an agreement and always the pipe would be at the center of of uh, of these negotiations and again the pipe itself is alive with the spirit each pipe has its own spirit the treaties we entered into using Indigenous laws and the use of the pipe. So I want to tell you a little bit about the Robinson treaties because we have good news coming out of the Ontario Superior Court. We have had two good wins in the last three years. So I'm going to show you those cases uh, involving litigation around the um, Robinson Huron and Robinson Superior treaties. So just some background, some history. Um, there was historically a relationship between the Anishinaabe and the French. And if any of you guys have studied that relationship, you would know um, there was a custom of intermarriage, cultural blending. That's where we get this Métis, the, the you know, constitutionally recognized group, the Métis in Canada. Um, this is a culturally significant group, historically significant group. They have constitutional status. Uh, and this has to do with this attitude where the Anishinaabe and French would agree to become family, right? So here's the principle, again, Anishinaabe principle of interrelationality. We love you, so we're going to join together as family. What happens, though, is actually the Haudenosaunee are allied with the British and the French and the British go to war. And there's this big, long war called the Seven Years War, which you may be familiar with it from 1756 to 1763, where the British and the Haudenosaunee fight on one side and the Anishinaabe and the French. So the Anishinaabe are allied with the French. Ultimately, the British end up winning the war. Um, but what's significant about that is even though the British win the war, the Anishinaabe people haven't formally entered into any treaty relationships with the British. And there's this wonderful speech, I share the speech all the time by um, a chief, his name is Minivavana in 1761, and he shared this speech with Alexander Henry, who was um, just scooting around, I guess, meeting with Anishinaabe people, I think he was a traitor. And he said, Englishmen, even though you have conquered the French, you have not conquered us, we are not your slaves. These lakes, these woods and mountains were left to us by our ancestors. They are our inheritance and we will part with them to no one. Englishmen, your king has never sent us any presents nor entered into any treaty with us. Wherefore he and I 
he and we are still at war, and until he does these things, we must consider that we have no other father, no other friend among the white men than the King of France. So a few things to notice here, um, the relationality, right? That you, when you enter into a treaty, you become not only friend, you also become a family. And also notice the treaty principle here of making gifts. Your king has never sent us any presents. The way that you confirm your relationship is through giving. So this custom of giving is very significant and very important. So what happens is King George, I actually have a dog named George. He's usually here beside me, but he's not. Sometimes I call him King George, um, not because of the Royal Proclamation, but probably because of that movie. I can't think of it right now. You know, I like to move it, move it, that one. I can't see your faces, so I don't know if anyone thinks this is funny. This is my humorous interlude. King George in, 19, in 1763, um, he knows he's succeeded in winning the war all the way over there from Britain, he needs to do something about the relationship with the indigenous people. And so what happens is he issues the Royal Proclamation because he knows that there are indigenous nations that continue to exist in British North America uh, and he needs to address their pre-existing land rights. And so this um, Royal Proclamation gets issued and it establishes how Britain how the British would manage the land in the British North America after the Seven Years' War. And one thing it does is it requires the Crown to enter into treaties with Indigenous nations. And the Crown can only enter into the treaties with the actual chiefs or principal men in the, it's called the principal men in that document. Um, and there has to be a treaty council that happens in order for the treaty be, to be valid. So this would prevent, for example, um, uh, they call them unscrupulous traders <laughs> from entering into treaties and taking land from indigenous people. So there's this principle here that comes out of the Royal Proclamation that land is communal and um, that indigenous nations own land collectively. And this type of thinking underlays Canadian law. And I have another long presentation about <laughs> all of the implications that come out of this designation, which I'm not going to share today and I'm not even going to try and go there. But just so you know, this is foundational to Canadian law and the way that indigenous people hold land today and I've got a great big Indian act on my table in front of me that I study and I write legal opinions for my clients and it comes out of the legal principles that come out of the royal proclamation so you say to me Nicole 1763 doesn't really interest me but I'm telling you this is the foundation of Canadian law now what happens is uh yeah it's fine the native people are like, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, King George, you're issuing a, a proclamation. But the way that we do business over here is that we need a treaty. Um, so what happens, and think about 1763. This summer, I tried to go kayaking. and It's very hard. It's, uh, I think we did like maybe 12K or 13K a day. What happens is there are runners that go out in 1763. They go out into the communities. So uh, they find all the Anishinaabe nations that are in different locations. And they say, King George wants you to come to a treaty council all the way in Niagara. And we'd like you to come down and it's important. And you know the king is requesting your presence. And think about the effort and the time. Like right now, I could just send my friend a text message and say, hey, let's meet at Starbucks and let's make a treaty. You know, I mean, I don't mean to be cute about these things, but things are so much more easier. Things are so much easier now. But think about the effort that would go into bringing all of these nations together. So this is a picture from the Anishinaabeg Nation. I'm going to give you the link to their resource material. And this shows all, this is a picture of graphic design picture of all of the different nations. There were over 2000 different nations that were represented or 2000 different chiefs, different participants. And the Royal Pro Proclamation was committed to a treaty vis-a-vis -vis a belt that was signed, the 1764 Treaty of Niagara Belt. And I'll show you a picture of that. Um, and I just, I think about, you know, the commitment of these people and I, primarily men, to go down all the way, you know, to, for, for me to kayak or for me to canoe from Thunder Bay all the way to Niagara Falls would take, I don't know, like four months, probably like that. That's a significant commitment. So these people really wanted to be there. And at this very sacred site at the base of um, Niagara Falls, Treaty of Niagara is important. 
And you can see that um, you'll see how the covenant, there's a treaty called the Silver Covenant Chain, and you can see that represented in this treaty. You see the two men holding hands, you see 1764. And the thing about silver that's important is that you need to polish silver. You need to continue to reconfirm the relationship. You need to continue to polish your silver. If you want it to look good, you have to make a commitment to it. And so here's another principle is renewal, right? You have to continually renew the relationship. Now this is important because here we get to the 1850 Robinson Superior and Robinson Huron Treaty. So um, what happens in around maybe 1840s is there's the discovery of uh, natural resources, specifically minerals in our territory. And um, minerals are valuable, right? And the Canada and Ontario want to, um, Ontario specifically, wants to enter into a treaty with these um, nations. And so they send out the Vidal, the two men, Vidal and Anderson, in 1848 and in 1849. And they go and they scoop out, hang out, find out who are actually in the territory and who needs to be treated with. Um, and so there's a big long list. I think there were, I don't know, 11 that were identified in the Robinson Superior, and I don't know how many in the Robinson Huron. So subsequently, all of these nations were invited to the treaty, um, to the Treaty Council, which happened in September of 1850. And what's interesting is um, in 1849, these list of bands, these list of communities, First Nation communities, nations, were um, set out. And in the report, it says the claim of the present occupants of this tract, so that traditional territory derived from their forefathers who have from time immemorial hunted upon it is unquestionably as good as that of any of the tribes who have received compensation from the cessation of their rights in other parts of the province, which is a big long way of saying these people own their land. And we acknowledge and recognize, so this is an official document that recognizes that the land is owned by the Anishinaabe people or that their title, I mean, land ownership according to Anishinaabe customs and values is pretty different than, uh, you know, uh, Canadian laws of ownership, but that there is a right that's recognized a title, an underlying title. Then um, there's some background, some lobbying, and I love uh, just teaching a little bit about Chief Podeshet, he was a chief of Fort William First Nation at the time, and he advocated strongly for the importance of the treaty, and he was one of the bargainers, one of the negotiators at this treaty council. And I love this representation because he talks about the fact that the land was given to Anishinaabe people through the Great Spirit. He says, now it is well known that 4,000 years ago, when we were first created, we all spoke one language. Since that, a change has taken place and we all speak different languages. You white people well know, we redskins know how we came into possession of this land. It was the great spirit who gave it to us. And from the time of our ancestors came upon this earth, it has been ours. And I love the idea that we are, when we, um, I do a lot of community work and when I work with the elders or when my clients work with the elders to talk about the ways that Anishinaabe Shinakanegawin, so Anishinaabe laws come into being or the source of the authority, it's from the Great Spirit. They're handed down from the Great Spirit. They're handed down from the Creator. And that is very special. The source of our authority is actually from the Great Spirit. So um, in 1850, in September 1850, there are two treaties that are negotiated. Some of you will not know, most of you will not know this. The boundaries of these treaties, so Lake Superior, um, Robinson Huron Treaty, is in the red and Robinson Superior is in the blue. Um, why are these treaties? <laughs> the what? Why are the designations the way that they are? Why? Why? Why are the? Why are the? Um, the boundaries the way that they are? They follow the height of land. So anything north of that blue line or that red line will actually flow into um, Hudson's Bay. So. I love this map because I think it's funny that you can draw a map about the Robinson Superior Treaty without including any of the Indigenous people that are a part or allegedly a part of that treaty. Anyway, 
it's a huge tract of territory. It goes from just south of Thunder Bay all the way from the Pigeon River boundary all the way down to um, just on the other side of on the other side of um, Sault Ste. Marie. So to travel that by car would be easily, I don't know, nine to 10 hours. Um, enormous, enormous tract of territory, very valuable tract of territory. So you'll see on the North Shore of Lake Superior Marathon, um, where I grew up and where I live, where my family is, we have multi-million dollar gold mines that have um, produced a ton of wealth for this, for this area and for the corporations that have owned that uh, mining enterprise without very much of it going to the Anishinaabe people around it. Um, also, just in case you want a really good map of the different of the different treaties that are in this area, this is the Anishinaabe Nation Treaty, uh, Anishinaabe Nation Territory. So you'll actually see on this map the Anishinaabe Nations within uh, these treaty areas are 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 um, named, and I'll leave this with you to look at later. So the primary written terms of the treaty is that the land is going to be ceased and surrendered. But actually, Anishinaabe people don't have a word for cease and surrender. Anishinaabe people don't actually believe themselves to be landowners in the same ways that, um, you know, Eurocentric or European ideas of land ownership exist. So that's a fundamental sort of disagreement. There's a one-time payment of two thousand dollars, or it's sort of two thousand pounds, and there's a new an annuity payment of four dollars, which is an annual payment. Um, the treaty terms say that this is subject to review. The key question is, has it ever actually been, re been reviewed? There are lands that are reserved for the exclusive use of First Nations. According to this, the terms of this treaty and the way that the government says, um, my community has 800 hectares, which is a very small amount of land according to this treaty. Um, and that's you know, something that's being negotiated and addressed. And it also protects hunting and fishing rights and promises annual cash payments. However, there are a few problems. The Robinson Superior Treaty was negotiated in one day. I mean, there were background negotiations, but I'm gonna tell you as a lawyer, I can't even barely write someone's will in one day. It takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of thinking. And so there are issues that are behind the scenes that weren't properly committed to writing that formed, um, formed basis of consideration of the parties. So there are issues, one of the issues that we see coming up um, are the leagues versus miles. So Anishinaabe people were customarily um, trading with or working with the French and a French league is almost three to four times as long as a mile. So there's a misapprehension of the fundamental unit of measurement, the annuity claims, which I'm gonna get to. And some First Nations people who were identified or nations who were identified um, on the Vidal Anderson Commission who didn't actually go to the treaty signing. They decided not to go for whatever reason. Um, so here's the good news. There was a case that was decided very recently. It was done in two parts. Uh, the third part, I, I think this case is being, uh, I saw in the news that it's going to be settled, negotiated, now settled. But there's a, claim, a challenge to the Robinson-Huron Treaty about the annuity amounts. And there were, there were claimants under the Robinson Superior Treaty who were added as parties or who intervened or who um, became a parties to the litigation. There were three components. Number one, did the treaty require the Crown to increase the annuity beyond $4? How do we understand the economic trigger? Meaning um, there's, that is supposed to say an amount, not among, an amount which will enable the government or of this province without incurring a loss to increase the annuity. So number one, was there a breach of the failure of the crown to increase the annuity beyond $4? And number two, um, how much was supposed to be, how, how, what, was, what amount was that supposed to be? You know, what amount of, of revenue has come from the, from the land that um, in principle, what does this mean? Should the amount of the, of the annuity be increased? Or at minimum, should we take the annuity amount into um, at least ad address it to inflation? So there's some fun law that comes out of this. Anyone that's been studying law like me was great, was glad to see that all of these principles came in. So there was um, the judge, her name was Justice Shaughnessy, I think. I have it here. 
yeah, it's Justice Hennessy. And I got to meet her. My friend Jessica Wolf became a judge not too long ago. So I went to her swearing in and Justice Hennessy was there. And that was really nice to see. I was like, hey, judge, good job on that case. And this was when the first um, the first part of the decision. And I was glad I had read it and I could talk <laughs> with this judge about her decision because it is really important. So she talks about the principle of the honor of the crown. The honor of the crown underlays all of the dealings between the crown and indigenous people. The honor of the crown, there's a case called um, Haida from 2014 that says the honor of the crown is always at stake in its dealings with indigenous people, First Nation people. So the crown has an obligation to diligently implement the treaty's promise to achieve their purpose. So three parts of this case, the first decision, the 2018 decision talks about the imp interpretation of the treaty's annuity augmentation process promise. So was the treaty supposed, was the treaty annuity amount supposed to be increased? The second part of the decision, the second decision was released just last year in 2010, or sorry, in 2020, that talks about whether the claim was statute barred, meaning did the Indigenous people sit on their rights for too long and not inserting and not bringing the claim forward? And then number three, here's the accounting piece, what is the value of the annuities? So we got so far, um, and I just want to show this to you, some of the principles of the treaty interpretation that show up in this decision. Um, a treaty is a sui generis. So this is a Latin word that means of its own kind. And we see this uh, a lot in law school in these Anishinaabe um, constitutional law cases. Everything when it comes to dealing with Anishinaabe people is sui generis, which is um, good and bad because it's good because we understand that there's a different type of law that underlays this. But it's it becomes dangerous because there's sometimes new law that's just developed to address this because the judges don't quite know what to do. And it's also good because it leaves an opening for creative lawyers, you know, to, um, to address this. So when I was in law school, it was in 2004, <laughs> the Haida case is not 2014, it's 2004. Um, I remember some of my older friends saying, you know, older lawyer friends saying, you know, Nicole, the honor of the crown is something that one of one of the lawyers just made up and put into their pleadings and suddenly it took you know and that's what's amazing about law is that it does grow over time the same idea as our principle of truth the principle of legal definitions and, and the growth of the law changes over time um number two there's a large liberal construction and discrepancies should be resolved in favor of the indigenous groups. Number three, if there are various possible interpretations, you have to find the common intention of the parties. Number four, the, the honor of the crown is always at stake. Number five, linguistics and cultural differences need to be put into context. And number six, treaty rights themselves are not frozen into time and courts have to update treaty rights in order to provide for their modern exercise, which is interesting, right? Like, how do we know what was negotiated in 1850 would turn into, into what we are dealing with today? So I'm actually not gonna go over these, but I'm going to share these slides with you. So you can, these are some of the, the great Supreme Court of Canada cases that deal with um, treaties. So they're SUI, Badgered, Sundown, and Marshall, and I can let you look at those. Just want to get to this point, which is um, Anishinaabe law was argued in the case, in uh, in the Ristul case. But what the judge ended up saying and what the parties had submitted was that we don't, Justice Hennessy, we don't want you to interpret Aboriginal law, Anishinaabe law, that's not what we're asking you, but we want you to take respectful consideration of Anishinaabe law and how that informs the common intention analysis. So when we're thinking about what the parties were actually agreeing to in 1850, we must absolutely think about what the role of Anishinaabe law is. What are the principles that would inform the ways that Anishinaabe people would negotiate? All right. I am, um, let's see, it's 12.50 now. There's just, I just wanna conclude on a few more points. So I'm gonna skip ahead here. In terms of, um, there, there's more I can tell you about Rustool. In terms of this reconciliation piece, you know, you say to me or to someone else, or maybe when you're angry, you're like, you know, why can't they just get over it? And here's a picture of um, Attawapiskat. This is a community that is the closest in proximity to the De Beers diamond mine, 
right up at the James Bay coast. And um, look at the look at the quality of the housing. And it behooves me, it blows my mind that this is acceptable when we have a resource company that is extracting millions and millions and millions of dollars for wealthy women to wear diamonds around. When we have Anishinaabe people, Indigenous people, Cree people living in Attawapiskat in conditions like this. And so Marie Sinclair says, you know, when people say, why can't they just get over this? He says, my answer has always been, why can't you remember this? Because this is about memorializing those people who have been the victims of a great wrong. We should never forget, even once they have learned from it, because it's a part of who we are. It is not just a part of who we are as survivors and children of survivors and relatives of survivors. It's a part of who we are as a nation. And this nation must never forget what it did to what it once did to its most vulnerable people. So there are probably 35 million things more that I could say, and maybe I can schedule the second half of this presentation later. Um, but I'm going to stop the share here. So if we have a few questions, we'll have about 10 minutes to do that. So thank you everyone for listening. I know I said a lot in a short period of time, and I, I appreciate uh, everyone's being here. Miigwech. Wow, that was a lot of really um, great discussion. I must say, as a non-legal person, um, I really appreciated how you took very complex issues and was and were able to um, put them in accessible language for those of us who aren't law students or lawyers, um, because I, I know full well that there are layers and layers and layers of complexity that underline all of the, the points that you shared with us today. And I would love to have you back for another round. Um, we are uh, just in the process right now of planning for Treaty Week in early November. So this is a really great primer for uh, more conversation to be happening in that particular area. I just want to say one thing that I didn't get to is I prepared like great slides on how to be a good ally. So I didn't get to that, but we can get to that because I know that we also have a lot of non-Indigenous people who are like, well, well, what can I do? I don't know how to do. I'm not a cultural person. I'd... And so I have some coaching there for you about things that things that you can do this in ways that you can ways that you can do this. Wonderful. OK, so we have had uh, lots of love down the chat for you. Um, <laughs> So just some of the comments, great presentation. Um, thanks for, for joining us. Um, such a helpful talk in so many ways. The understanding and impact of the history on my work is vital. Uh, thank you for your service and auth authenticity. Um, just as a note, uh, I did put a note in the chat that uh, Anna Chief will be sending an email out to everybody once our YouTube link is live with the edited video. And we can include your presentation slides at that point to everyone who participated today. So thank you for that. Very generous. Um, I'm not sure if I have any questions coming up, but I do maybe have a few comments that we can can move forward to. And one of the things that struck me was your comments around 1763 um, and that document being really a pinnacle piece to understanding um, everything that has happened after that, both in you know written and in human to human relationship. Right. So, I don't know yeah. if you want to comment further on that. It's a big one. And I think just the ways that, so one thing that the Royal Proclamation said, and this is underlined and supported by the doctrine of discovery, the Royal Proclamation says somehow, and I don't really quite know how, that the underlying title is actually owned by the crown. So even though Indian people, and I use that word Indians, we're Indians under the India Act, even though Indigenous people, Anishinaabe people have been on their lands since time immemorial, by some magic, the underlying title to the crown, the underlying title to land somehow gets transferred to the crown. And so this is what becomes problematic for us uh, today when I'm you know, writing, helping my First Nation clients. Um, that means because the underlying title to Anishinaabe land is held by the crown, that creates legal difficulties in, uh, for example, if I went to live in my First Nation, I couldn't get a mortgage to have a house because I wouldn't own the underlying title to the land. Um, in Anishinaabe people are tax exempt for um, income earned on reserve because the land, the, the income is, um, you can't tax what you don't own. So there's a presumption that Anishinaabe people don't actually own that. Um, 
you can't garnish, for example, land on reserve or um, Indian property on reserve because, again, an assumption that Anishinaabe people don't actually own their land. So it creates a different legal system of, of ownership. It also gives rise to this principle of called the fiduciary duty. And you guys will have heard that. That means when the Crown is dealing with Anishinaabe people's land or First Nations people land, because they're the only ones that can buy or purchase or treat with Anishinaabe people, they have to act like a fiduciary, fiduciary because uh, they are the only ones. So to prevent a monopoly and taking advantage of a monopoly, um, they have these special duties, fiduciary duties, which comes from a state's law. Anyway, they have to act in the best interest. So it creates a lot of legal complexities that we're still dealing with today and that you guys will have seen even in your uh, individual practices and experiences. I hope, that's, I hope that's the answer. I have a long presentation about this issue because it's one of the ones that bothers me. And this issue of sovereignty and the assertion of sovereignty, um, Justice McLaughlin, as she then was in the Haida case, says that the issue of crown sovereignty has to still be addressed. It has not been properly dealt with. The, the assertion of sovereignty in Canada um, is not real, is not legally real. Great. And we have a question from Sam Manitowabi. Um, it says in Restool, Ontario, or in Restool, Ontario continues to refuse to negotiate and still assert control over Crown lands. What can First Nations do to overcome this? We have about three minutes left. So <laughs> I think we'll go to Anthony if we have time. No, it's a good question. And I think um, the answer is I think your your chiefs and your leaders have done a really good job in advancing this case. And this case was actually started when I was a law student, a young lawyer. I, I think I probably helped write the pleading. So it's been a long time coming. It's been researched. It's not easy. And, you know, the honor of the crown um, requires good faith dealing at all times. And so, you know, it gets annoying to always have to remind, remind, remind. But it's a different, it's, you know, two different mindsets that are coming together and to, to achieve a meeting of the minds where everyone feels comfortable uh, sometimes takes litigation. That's why we need lawyers. That's why we continue to need to send people to law school to do this. As tiring as it is to be a lawyer, it's really, really important. So, I would say it's being done. Your chiefs are doing it. They pay a lot of attention. They're very organized leaders. And uh, what's amazing about the Robinson, Robinson Huron chiefs in particular is they're very, very, very informed by principles of Anishinaabe Odsuin and they consult with the elders in a good way. And so, uh, so it is happening. I, don't, I can't answer that without specific, um, more specifics. That's great, thank you. And Anthony ha has the final question before we close off. Anthony? Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Anthony Shapway Kizik. I'm from uh, White Sand First Nation. I'm taking a course at the university now. And uh, one of the things that I started scribbling over the weekend was about uh, truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, your first few uh, slides were truth is not always absolute and it's okay to disagree. Um, and when we're talking about truth and reconciliation, uh, what uh, what definition of truth are we looking for? Is yeah. it uh, uh, <clears throat> our own Anishinaabe to say it's okay what you did, or are we looking for a more uh, legal or uh, more solid definition of truth in order for us to? Uh, uh, be okay to uh, sit at the table because we're talking about conciliation and reconciliation now. I love this question. And this, I love this question. And this is exactly what I've been thinking about, Anthony. And like, how do we reconcile those two views where sometimes our elders will say like, it's okay that you don't get it. You're never going to get it. You're never going to be able to understand on our level. However, the truth is important and the history is important. And I think maybe there are, when we talk about types of truth, I think the spiritual nature of like what's underneath the truth or the spiritual meanings are something that maybe people can't actually understand in deeper and more meaningful levels. But absolutely, I think like the whole principle of reconciliation, we can't get to reconciliation without the truth and without the healing. And the healing is something that is absolutely going to take time. And I think it has the truth, the construction of truth has to come from 
the stories have to come from the communities about the impact and about what happened. And I, you know, I'm glad that you brought this up because it's it's exactly what I've been thinking about. And I don't I don't quite know uh, that's something that I think I would have to go in and and go into ceremony to think about because it's a bigger answer than I know the answer to. Jimmy Gwetch. What a great way to end. And thank you, Anthony, for the questions. Nice to see you. Um, I would just like to uh, say chimiigwech to you, Nicole, for joining us, um, for all of the guests who came today to spend time with us, and for those who may be watching down the road um, as this gets put on our, our, our YouTube channel. Um, this was really a wonderful opportunity. It's very sincere, very heartfelt, very knowledgeable, and uh, really appreciated you bringing um, your perspective you know, to these important discussions. I um, would also like to invite the group that's with us today um, to continue to participate in all of our upcoming uh, events over the coming this week and next week. Uh, if you would like to join us tomorrow, we have speaker Dr. Brianna Scott on reconciliation through Metasage beginning at noon. And all upcoming events can be found on the Lakehead events calendar. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a great day. Kawabam and Minowa.